welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author joining us from our studios in Denver is Father Tim Gallagher, OMV. We're talking about a book, A Biblical Way of Praying the Mass, published by EW10. Also, another book, Discernment of Spirits in Marriage, published by Sophia. We'll get to that later in the program. It's always great to see you, Father Tim. How are you doing? Always great to be here. Thanks, Doug. Now, you were on with Father Mitch uh, just talking about the book we're talking about here, Biblical Way of Praying the Mass. Now, the Mass, people say, okay, the Mass is a prayer. And so what's special about this biblical way of praying the Mass? And there relates to the Eucharistic wisdom of Venerable Bruno Lanteri. Who is he? He was the founder of our community, declared Venerable by St. Paul VI. And um, he lived in times that, you know, um, our own times are getting more and more like his. He lived through the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the persecution of the church, even the imprisonment of the Holy Father. He risked his life in defense of the Holy Father, paid the price. He was arrested, interrogated, exiled, and so forth. So he lived in very difficult and uh, troubling, worrisome times and shaped a message of encouragement for people, uh, a way to stand firm and solid in the midst of shifting times like this. And I find that his teaching is becoming increasingly contemporary. So that's kind of a general background uh, for this. Now, what does this book do? Well, it addresses that space in our spiritual lives in which, uh, of course, we love the Mass. We understand that it is the source and summit, as the Council says, of the Christian life. But my guess would be that many of us leave Mass wondering if we can even remember the readings, for example, mm -hmm. if I may say that, um, wishing somehow we were more attentive at various parts of the Mass, wishing that the experience and prayer and, and receiving communion reached a deeper place in our hearts, wishing that we left the Church more uh, changed, mm -hmm. deepened, strengthened, nourished by the Mass than we do. And here is a simple, effective, I'll say doable, way to grow in actually praying the Mass from the heart. So that's what he's offering here. Okay, let me ask you, you say right in the beginning, who of us does not cherish the Mass and also desire to pray it more deeply? It, it, I guess that's a supposition now that I'm not so sure is as universal for Catholics as maybe it was at one time. It seems like a lot of people are either treating the Mass as an obligation that they have to check off, or even now in the COVID period we're dealing with, where obviously people are have been restricted many times to doing it from at home. Uh, I'm not sure so many people are so anxious, even if the restrictions get lifted, to go back to church or feel that they're missing so much, but they are, aren't they? Right, and so that makes the same point in almost a deeper way. So let's say you have two different perspectives there. One is the devout person, and probably many of our listeners fit this profile, who would long for a deeper experience of the Mass and not quite sure how to do it. All right, here is a way. But what about the person who doesn't feel engaged in the Mass, doesn't feel the importance of being there? How are we going to change that in a person's heart? There's no superficial way to do that. The only way to do that is to go deeper into the Mass. And here is, as I've just said, a very simple, practical, and doable way to do that. What led me to write this book was that the, this approach that Venerable Bruno gives, I haven't seen it anywhere else, not even in any of the greatest saints or spiritual writers, and that's why it seemed to me important that it be right. shared. I've been using it now for uh, probably about 45 years at this point. Do I always do it perfectly? No, but does it make a difference? Yes, I know right. that it does, and that's why I really wanted to share it. You say in here, in order to truly pray the Mass, he chose various biblical figures whose sentiments he wished to share at corresponding parts of the Mass. And you said, over the years, I have come to love this approach. Let me ask you, what insight do you think he had, since you just said you haven't seen it anywhere else? What Was there a moment in his life, or when was that moment where he realized that was a great way to approach the Mass? Remarkably, early on, uh, he shaped this for himself at the age of 22 or 23. We still have the manuscript uh, in which he traces out a spiritual program for his life and includes this approach, which he then later wrote a second time and shared with others. Um, it, the, the, the intuition is very simple. 
And that is, you know, I'd say it this way. If we think about how can I deepen and grow in my experience of the Mass, our thought is, well, let me learn more about the Mass, which is really important, obviously. But his approach then takes it a different, uh, a step further. How can I pray the Mass from my heart, from that deep, warm center where God resides deeply within me? How can I engage my heart in the Mass? And what he does is to choose a biblical figure whose own heart and sentiments at a given moment in that person's life mirrors what we hope to experience in our own hearts at the corresponding part of the Mass. So it's not complicated. You don't have to go through a series of rational steps. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an intuition of a biblical figure's uh, heart, which tells our heart uh, the space in which it's invited to live that. Now, that may sound abstract. As soon as we give some examples, that'll get very clear. I was going to say, because you said right here it, it's, it's uncomplicated, and you say it transforms presence at Mass into prayer. It excludes no one. And the goal of this book is to offer this way of praying the Mass. It's uncomplicated, but it sounded sort of complicated there, what you said. And then it excludes no one. I need to All understand right. what that means. And also, how did he determine which biblical people did he want to associate with different parts of the Mass? And is it always the same? And did he always have the same people? All right. I think the, the best way to do this is to give an example. Mm -hmm. um, because this is not, there's not, nothing, I tried to summarize this in an almost <laughs> abstract way, but there's nothing abstract about this. So you are, let's make it a Sunday morning Mass. Uh, you're preparing at home, getting everything in order. You head out to the car, you drive whatever number of minutes it is to the church. You park, you walk into the church. Uh, you head down the aisle, genuflect, and take your place in the pew. Probably up ahead of you around the altar, there are servers or lectors or the priests preparing things and getting things ready. All right, what's, what's in our hearts while all of this is happening? Is this just a series of physical actions that are necessary in order to be there when Mass begins? Or can that be lived in a spiritual way? And Venerable Bruno's proposal is, as you're doing all of this, ask for the sentiments that filled the heart of Simeon as he headed to the temple to meet the child, to meet the Christ child, as we read in the scriptures. Now, here was a man who, for years in his life, uh, longed for the, to see the Christ of the Lord before he dies. And today, his heart uh, knows in the spirit that this is the day. And you see him leave home, see him walk through the streets, see him enter the temple, mm -hmm. see the moment when he actually meets the child, the desire, the longing, the sense of something important that's about to happen, um, the meeting with, with the Christ of the Lord. Ask for something of that heart as you go through these steps. Now, what if, let's compare two ways of uh, beginning Mass, one in which I've done all of those steps just because I have to do them without thinking much about them, and another in which, without adding any time to any of that, at least periodically, I'm asking the Lord to have a heart something like that of Simeon. Mm -hmm. Now, a Mass prepared and begun that way is already going to be very different from a Mass in which none of that was there. Now, that's just one of these biblical figures, but mm -hmm. that, that's what he's inviting us to do, right. is to, to have the sentiments of a heart that allow us to live that part of the Mass more deeply. Okay. Now, you also mentioned that the, the corresponding images that are, are put in the book, in the color section of this book, uh, what's an example of those images and who picked them out? Well, uh, who picked them out? Uh, I guess I did. Why are the images there? They're there because of something that is uh, essentially an Ignatian approach to praying with Scripture. You know how Ignatius invites us, let's say if you pray with, um, well, the presentation in the temple, to be there imaginatively, to see the scene and enter into it with the help of the imagination that God has given us. So the images are put there to help the reader not only mm -hmm. read about this, but actually see it in a way that can make it more concrete so that when the person is the next time actually going to Mass, that may more readily be present to the person. Now, you write in, in kind of a, a personal reflection. You talk about your mother being a convert, your dad, how often they went to Mass, how important the Mass was really to you as a child gr growing up. And then you talk about uh, the idea that I assisted Pope John Paul II as a deacon three times, twice in St. Peter's 
And you say, I still smile at one memory from time to time related to St. John Paul II. What was that? All right. Well, uh, anybody who spent any time with St. John Paul II, and I did all my uh, seminary years in Rome. I was lived over there for about, I think it was nine years in Rome. And it was during the beginning of his pontificate. And uh, he would, he would periodically, from his prayer as he was celebrating Mass, he would periodically, from that deep recollection, uh, gaze up suddenly with a gaze of, I'd say, almost uh, piercing awareness of everything around him. It was just remarkable. You just knew that he was taking in everything around him. Well, when he was recollected in prayer um, during the Mass, I served as deacon, as you mentioned, so I was very close to him. And I would shamelessly stare at him, just drinking in the image of this man at prayer. But then suddenly he'd look up, and I would immediately have to drop my eyes, you know. Um, but of course, as soon as he went back to his prayer, I'd resume my, my, my staring. So that's the memory that I'm citing there. You also mentioned that during your seminary years, you listened to Venerable Fulton Sheen's talk to priests, and, and you talk about meditation and the quiet of your room. What's the connection between Sheen and that approach in your own prayer life? Well, in all of his talks to priests, Venerable Sheen always went to one point. He would recommend praying the holy hour, an hour every day in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. When I entered our community, I found that Venerable Bruno made a similar recommendation that we spend an hour every day in meditation. Initially, I would do that in my room because it was quiet. I wouldn't be distracted. But what, it wasn't long before Venerable Sheen and Venerable Lanteri kind of came together for me, and I began doing that before the Blessed Sacrament. And um, uh, Vo uh, Venerable Sheen is right. They're both right. That right. practice makes all the difference. Now, you say in that same section, uh, under a personal word, a memory of my mother surfaces as I write this. What was that memory? Well, when I would visit... Uh, after ordination, I'd visit at home. I, of course, wanted to spend this hour before the Blessed Sacrament every day. And uh, the church was just a mile away. And so I would go down there. When my mom was free, she um, was happy to come along with me. And so often we'd be there together, just a few feet apart in, in the pew. And I might be fidgeting and wondering, you know, distracted and so on, but she wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in the latter part of her life, and a long life of faithful prayer had led her evidently to a point where she would just be in silence before the Lord, not much movement there. And you just really had to reverence the uh, deep, I would say, contemplative prayer that was there. It was a very beautiful witness. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things uh, you mentioned at the beginning about uh, Venerable Bruno and his, you know, standing up for the faith, and you said here, you said on various occasion, Benedict XVI cited the 49 Christians of the 4th century who defied the Emperor's prohibition to celebrate Mass, and, and you talk about this, where they ultimately say, without Sunday Mass, we cannot live. I guess the question sometime in the world we live in today with COVID and just in general, do we have that same sense of urgency that we see in the past? And if we don't, why not? Again, I think you have to answer and say there's an array of responses to that. I was just speaking with a woman uh, just a few days ago who uh, reflected on that time, let's say from March through May, when Mass was not available earlier uh, last year, and just the, the, the deep Eucharistic hunger that that awakened. I think some of us have had that response. For others, the response has been less, and it's really a question of how much we understand and appreciate the Mass. And again, that's the whole point of this book. Here is, we don't want to be complicating it. This is the simplest, most practical way I've ever come across mm -hmm. of praying the Mass. It's simply focusing your heart on what's happening at various parts of the Mass. Uh, that's where this approach comes in, because it can help cross that bridge from Mass as an experience that to some degree, I, I recognize as important, but it hasn't yet really s spoken deeply to my own experience. This can help cross that bridge so that the Mass becomes something that I pray personally in a way that really engages me. So yes, we have some work to do there, and here is an instrument that can help do it. Absolutely, so that's a, 
a biblical way of praying the Mass, Eucharistic Wisdom of Venerable Bruno Lanteri, published by EW10. Let's talk in a closing minutes here about another book. You're always writing books here. Discernment of Spirits in Marriage, Ignatian Wisdom for Husbands and Wives. One is St. Ignatius. People always say, well, here's a priest. What can a priest give insights to people who are married since they were never married? The reason he can do this is because what he's describing is the ordinary experience of the spiritual life in every day. So what he's talking about is the kind of thing that goes on when you get up in the morning and you either look forward to the day or you feel discouraged about it, when you want to pray or don't feel any desire to pray, um, as when you go to work, uh, life in the family, issues of health and so on. There's a lot of up and down spiritual experience that's going on all the time in daily living. And that's why this applies. Now what this book tries to do uh, is to create a readable, accessible way for people called specifically to the vocation to marriage, husbands and wives, to see how that teaching can help them in their daily life, in the family and in their marriage. Uh, Ignatius is not writing, let's say, like St. John of the Cross or some of Teresa of Avila, where it's very beautiful, but we recognize that it's on an elevated level, mm -hmm. and we may feel there's a distance between what he or she is writing about and where I am. You won't feel that with Ignatius. Right. He's right down in the trenches with you in the daily ups and downs. Do you think that's why uh, the spiritual exercises are so popular in a popular way these days? Yes, we have something new happening now, and that is that uh, across vocations, in a way that I don't think has ever really happened before. Um, Ignatius is being made accessible. I'd like to hope that some of the books I've written have contributed Absolutely. to that, Absolutely. and there are others also doing this. And, um, you know, I, I get a lot of feedback from people who are so grateful for this teaching, mm -hmm. specifically even the teaching you have in this book, because, oh, for the first time I understand what's going on. Now I know what I need to do, right. and that's liberating. Right. Now, it's an interesting format you have with this, the characters of Mark and Anne. How did you develop that approach? This book came about because one of my editors, I don't know, five, six years ago, suggested, would you ever think of writing a novel about Ignatian discernment with the idea that people who might not read a formal book on the spiritual life might possibly read a uh, uh, a presentation in novelistic form and then be drawn more deeply into the teaching. So I thought about it, consulted, and finally came up with this model. It's what I'd call a semi-novel. So we have a continuous story in each chapter, but we periodically interrupt the story t to explain it in the light of the corresponding rule from St. Ignatius. Right, and you actually you mentioned the fact that... So the, the, the goal... The Go ahead, Father. Yeah, the goal is to create a very readable, easily readable, accessible presentation of this teaching. Right. You also have uh, the rules in, in the back, and you mentioned here as well that the idea that uh, the purpose of these rules is to set captives free to offer a path toward freedom, to love and serve the Lord in daily life. May this guide, may they guide spouses to that freedom and to the blessings that follow in their marriage and families. Do you think at this point in time, you know, uh, in a lot of cases that uh, there's a lot of pressure on the married state and, 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 uh, and pressure on the whole concept of marriage in the culture? Oh, very much so. And that's why I think this particular teaching of St. Ignatius applied specifically to marriage gets increasingly important. Essentially, what Ignatius is doing in this teaching is helping us to overcome spiritual discouragement, or what he calls spiritual desolation, the times when we get disheartened. And we both know there's an awful lot of that in the air right now. And, of course, uh, marriages and families, you know, can, can be burdened by this. And so a clear, practical, usable teaching that shows us how to understand and negotiate that and find freedom from that burden, I think, becomes increasingly mm -hmm. important today. Now, you recently uh, had filmed <clears throat> some, uh, some series for us. Uh, uh, one was one that's going to come out based upon the discernment of spirits in marriage, uh, the book we're talking about for the future. You also uh, taped another one. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that one? 
Yeah, that's on an earlier book uh, which uh, we did together, which I did with EWTN, entitled Overcoming Spiritual Discouragement, The Power and Spiritual Wisdom of Venerable Bruno Lanteri. So it's a selection of 114 quotations from his letters and spiritual notes which equip us to deal with discouragement in the spiritual life. And I've offered some brief commentary on those. So we did a series based on that teaching, which I think also for the same reason is getting increasingly important. Now, when you, when you work on something, do you first develop the material for a presentation or a retreat and then that becomes the material for a book or do you write a book and then kind of create a retreat out of it? What's your style? Most of the time the book is a crystallizing on paper of a lived experience, usually over many years, you know, of gradually getting to know a certain teaching and most of the time, as you suggest, you know, teaching it many times in person and then eventually putting it in book form. Mm -hmm. That's how these books came about, too. So when, when you're writing, do you write multiple, are you working on multiple books at the same time, or do you tend to work on one thing, get that finished before you move on to the next? Mm -hmm. Until COVID, I was always one book at a time, usually one a year. Uh, when COVID began, I thought, well, all right, everything's canceled, I have time. So I looked at the folder and had about three books going and did them one after another during this COVID time. Those are the books that are coming out now. So in normal circumstances, one at a time. In COVID, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Well, did you find it easier to write with COVID because of the fact that you weren't maybe traveling as much? I mean, was that something that actually Very much so. somewhat yeah. easier for you mm -hmm. to do? And you've been doing Very some more so. of those yeah. kind of remote kind of uh, virtual uh, teaching events and things. How do you find that compares to being there in person? You lose something and you gain something. I mean, obviously, given a choice, I would prefer, as I think all of us would, to do things in person. So you lose something with the virtual. You're not there with the people. I think they tend to be more tiring because you're putting out energy and not mm -hmm. receiving it th back through the uh, interaction with uh, a live group of people before you. The advantage is that um, uh, geography doesn't matter. So we'll do these events and have people around the world you know, participating, many more people participate when we do them virtually. Also financially, it's easier for everyone uh, mm -hmm. since travel is not involved in lodgings and all of those kinds of things. So it's a mixture, mm -hmm. and, but I, I will say I'm really grateful to be doing it right now in a time of COVID. Please God, which will pass before too much longer. But it's been a blessing in this time. Absolutely. So what are you working on now? Do you have another book in the works? Uh, the next book I'm thinking of, but it's still just a thought, would be to uh, amplify an earlier book and to create a series of maybe one-page biblical reflections. Mm -hmm. And there'd be enough of these to take a person through the entire Ignatian spiritual exercises. They could be used in that format or uh, simply for personal prayer. Uh, the earlier book that I did along this line with 40 biblical reflections like this seems to have been used quite a lot. So I'm considering amplifying it um, into a full series on the Ignatian spiritual exercises, but that remains to be seen. We'll see. Do you, do you have a sense based on the, the events you do and the purchase and who you for, hear from, what your, the audience is for your books as far as demographically? Do you have a sense of that? It's a good question, which I can't answer um, really too clearly because I don't have that kind of data. Um, I think these books, the earlier books that I was writing up until we started these series now with EWTN and mm -hmm. Sophia, tended to be a little more um, structured and formational. Mm -hmm. These, these uh, contemporary books intend now to break that teaching open in a more accessible way. Right. So they have a broader audience now. Um, the earlier books, it might have been a little bit more people who were more deeply into these things. These present books now are, um, the audience has amplified to pretty much anybody who's interested in the faith. Absolutely, and we appreciate you writing these books as well as doing these series for us. It's uh, Father Timothy Gallagher joining us from our Denver studios. Two books, Discernment of Spirits in Marriage, Ignatian Wisdom for Husbands and Wives. Boy, we could use that today. 
And also, EW10 proudly published A Biblical Way of Praying the Mass, the Eucharistic Wisdom of Venerable Bruno Lanteri. Always great to see you, Father Tim, and we shall see you next time. And we thank all of our audience for joining us here on Bookmark. We shall see you next time as well. Stay well.